So, Diana, when, uh, when she first found out about this conference, I think she was the most enthusiastic respondent. She's like, I want to do this, let's do it. So, uh, I, I really love her topic, and uh, I'm excited to hear what she has to say, because I think, in, in many respects, this is the key to, to fixing what we talked about earlier, where the word has crossed the chasm, but, but Agile uh, perhaps hasn't. So, I'll turn the time over to Diana. Take it away. Everyone hear me? Okay, way in the back. Can you hear me? Okay, good. Um, yes, I'm Diana Larson. I um, wear a number of different hats um, in this community. I'm my the first hat that I wear that I sort of entered the community with is I'm a consultant with a company called Future Works Consulting that's um, based in Portland, Oregon, and. Um, no, I wish I got to work there more. <laughs> I end up traveling quite a bit. I also, um, then after that, I uh, wrote a book with Esther Derby, which we um, pair wrote. And we used as many, we had a backlog that we pulled from, and we used as many of the Agile practices as we could as we wrote this book, um, just because it made us feel more like walking the talk, which we want to do. So it's this book. And currently, I'm chairing the uh, Agile Alliance Board of Directors. So if you have any questions about the Agile Alliance and what it does or what it doesn't do or what you'd like it to do or comments or anything like that, please feel free to come up and talk to me over the next couple of days. I'd love to have those conversations. And, um, and I, I would be remiss if I don't remind you of another conference that's coming up later this year the Agile 2009 conference um, at the end of August, which is the biggest Agile conference that goes on every year. And um, I can't know, I don't know that I would claim it is the best, but it is the biggest for sure. It's international. And we this year we had 50, over 1,500 submissions. And um, that group of 1,500 mostly really good submissions was culled down by 80%, so that only 20% were um, able to be accepted and will show up in the conference this fall. So it may not be the best conference in the world, but it's going to be pretty darn good. And Johanna tells me I should say it will be phenomenal, so, just so Johanna knows. So we have come here to talk about um, principle number 12. I always like to kind of go back to first cases. And, and, and so when I heard about Agile Roots and we really wanted to be talking about the foundations and the fundamentals, I said, okay, so I want to look for principles. And I, so I picked out a couple of them and I send a couple, sent a couple of ideas to Andrew. And I said, well, you know, what, what of these should we do? And the, the reason I like looking at principles, the values are great. And as somebody said to me today, yeah, but, you know, in some way they're kind of abstract and they're kind of motherhood and apple pie and how do we really know? And it's like principles really are statements of values in action. If we have these values, what does it really look like? And so here's something that you could actually recognize. Um, if you're working in a team, is that team at regular intervals reflecting on how to become more effective than tuning and adjusting its behavior? You can know if you're doing that or not. You can check yourself, right? So I thought, well, let's explore this further. With Esther, I wrote a book about retrospectives in some circles. I'm known as the retrospective goddess. Um, and and yet, there are lots of other ways. And so I wanted to explore some, of, some more about retrospectives, but more about there are lots of ways to reflect on how to become more effective, tune, and adapt. And so I wanted to talk more about that. So one of the things that we know, um, I actually came to the um, 
to Agile after a long time of working in various forms of high-tech organizations and over time sort of evolving more and more into working with IT and more and more to working with software exclusively. But over that period of time, working with high-performance teams, spending a lot of time consulting and sometimes offering training and, and team development and how to make that shift and so on, I learned a lot about um, instructional design. And I learned a lot about how people really make changes. And one of the things that I discovered is that learning really equals change. Once you've learned a new thing, you can never go back and unlearn it, failing some kind of head trauma. Right? It's yours. And, and so you, you take that now into consideration for everything that you do going forward. It's really easy to say we're going to tune and adjust, and adjust, but until you've done it and, and have captured that learning and, are, and, and that has caused you to say, you know, I really think we want to do something a little differently than the way we've been doing it. You've not really been through that cycle. Um, the other thing that the, the principal talked about was regular intervals. Well, how do we know what regular intervals are? How do we choose that? What, what are those? And how do we make the change, behavior change, when we learn? Once we've learned something, how do we then do that tuning and adapting as we move forward? So I also use some um, a practice called appreciative inquiry quite a bit, and it has it's based on five theories, and one of them is called the principle of simultaneity. And it says once you ask a question about something, once you begin to inquire in a particular direction and gain a little new information there you've already begun the process of change. So a lot of principle number 12 is about gathering the learning that helps us change in the way that we believe will help us be more effective. So, by the act of retrospective, by the act of learning, and then that causing change, you can think of retrospection as a revolutionary act turning something around. And the way I know that is from a man named Paulo Freire, which his last name I have a hard time with. He's a Portuguese man, grew up in Brazil, um, worked a lot in Brazil, and he, he posited something that he looked at, that he saw a lot with the people he was working with, that he called the action reflection praxis. He wrote a book out of, out of his observations called The Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And he explored the role of learning in change. For, for in his instance, he was looking for people who wanted to, you know, oppressed people who really needed to improve their living conditions. Which I thought was, um, uh, was interesting because when I first started talking to some of the 17 people, who were in Snowbird back when, and I asked them, well, why did you, you know, why are you using, you know, why are you promoting these new methods? Why do you, why do you want to do this? I started hearing a lot about sustainable pace. And I started hearing a lot about, well, we really want to improve our work lives. Right? We want the work lives of people who develop software to be better. And and that got reinforced for me about a year and a half ago when the Agile Alliance Board got together and said, you know, people know about the word Agile. That was a part of the original um, charter for the Agile Alliance, was to sort of begin to spread the word, let people know about Agile, and people know some things about it now. It's more widely known. Is that enough of a purpose for us at this point? And the Agile Alliance Board said, no, it's not, really. We need to, we need to get develop, develop for ourselves a larger purpose. And as that group of 12 people talked, what emerged out of that was a purpose statement that said, 
uh, we want to support and encourage those who are using agile methods in order to make the software industry more productive, sustainable, and humane. So there's still that underlying we're learning in order to make our work better and our work lives better. So retrospection, revolutionary act. Some of the things that Paolo had to say about this, liberation is a practice, praxis, the action and reflection of men and women upon their world in order to transform it. That's what we mean by tune and adapt, right? Make a transformation in how you're working. Reflection upon situationality is reflection about the very condition of existence. Critical thinking by means which People discover each other to be in a situation, right? We want to understand more. We stop and reflect because we want to understand more about the situation that we're in. Because from that understanding, from that learning, we know we can make the change. And I love this last one. People are fulfilled only to the extent that they create their world, which is a human world and create it with their transforming labor. In other words, it makes much more of a difference if we are the ones who figure out the changes that need to be made and we are the ones who implement them. So that is us tuning and adapting. And in the, um, I was listening, over listening to, listening to the experience reports next door and so one of the things that I heard was from Peter Green. Retrospectives were extremely powerful for our team in making this, meaning Agile, work for us. And then he went on to say, it's because it fostered team self-discovery. Our team invented test-driven, their team invented test-driven development for themselves. He talked about how that was much more powerful than having somebody come in and say, you know, you're about at the time when adopting test-driven development would be good, and let me show you how to do that. Right? They figured it out for their, themselves. They, they through, the, through reflecting, through tuning and adapting, they became more effective. So another, another, place that these ideas come from is from the lean world. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with the PDCA, the Plan, Do, Check, Act, also known as the Shoehart Cycle, sometimes known as the Deming Cycle. Although when Deming talked about it, he talked about it as the Shoehart Cycle because Shoehart was one of his mentors. And um, and he learned this method in collaboration with Schuhart. So planning means to establish objectives and develop processes to deliver results aligned with expected outcomes. So we have an expectation, we plan to achieve it, we determine what results we want and, and how we're going to deliver those. Doing is then implementing that process. And what's interesting to me about this is that Schuhart and Deming actually added an addendum to that, which was not only implement the process, but on as small a scale where possible. <coughs> which sounds to me like a focus on small teams and small chunks of work and doing things in, in smaller time boxes. Check is compare the actual results against the expected results. An act is analyze the comparison. Seek the root causes of compliance or variation. Determine where to apply changes that will create improvement. And the, one of my sources had a, said, each complete cycle increases our knowledge of the system under study. So earlier today I made a, an assertion that what we really need to be looking at was how our systems were influencing our behavior. This opportunity to reflect and tune and adapt gives us an opportunity to look at the system 
one of the things that I've been a little concerned about um, in, the, in the move to Kanban, which I think is, has a lot of merit and is a good move, a movement in that direction, but I hear a lot about, well, now that we've got Kanban, we don't have to have any kinds of team meetings. We just take care of things as they come along. And, you know, we certainly can toss you know, the time we had previously spent on retrospectives out the door. And my, my wonder when I hear that, what I get curious, curious about is, so you're going to get really good at single loop learning by stopping and fixing things right in the moment. When do you get to double loop learning? When do you get to looking at the overall pattern of the kinds of issues seems to me you do that when you actually take time to stop and reflect. So, in the checking and acting part, we do root cause analysis in PDCA. We use lots of different tools. We use um, an Ishikawa diagram. How many of you are familiar with that? Also known as the fish bone, where each of these large bones of the fish get labeled. Um, some people use five P's. We have a, a, a bone for people and product and process and plant or place and protocol, right? And then we look at the impact of each of those parts of the system on the issue that we are actually trying to, to look at in the moment. Um, other, other causes that people sometimes label those bones with are marketplace, benefits, location, maintenance, environment, transport, skills, communication, policies and procedures, equipment, methods, materials, measurement or metrics, and management. So we can really look at some big chunks of the system and how it begins to affect, sometimes this is a cause, called a cause and effect diagram too, how can those that parts of the system which we know influence it, influence the behavior. How are they influencing behavior in this particular case? So moving one step up from just fixing what's in the moment to a larger consideration of how really is the system making this happen. So for example, um, So take, take the example of a team that does have a Kanban board. And they've got a clearly labeled. We can take three cards, work in process. And yet week after week, they notice that five cards are showing up in the column. Well, a simple fix for that in the moment is just, oh, move the cards back, right? These, these two don't belong there. It's done. We figured it out. But why are those cards showing? Well, so-and-so is moving them. Well, why is so-and-so moving them? What are the pressures? What else is going on in this system that's causing that behavior to happen? Some other ways of doing root cause analysis, really stopping and analyzing your system and what's going on, are the five whys. Five whys is a wonderful tool um, where we ask why five times. Have any of you used this one? Yeah, it's great fun. And it's, it's great fun to map it so that you start out with a question and then you answer that question, you write that answer down, and then you transform that into the next question and you go on and on. Sometimes there's branches, it gets very exciting. And, but eventually you get to a place where you're saying, well, just because, right? And then you know you've, you've reached it. If you push, push through that and you can't get any further, you know you've probably reached a root cause. We did this um, just, just the other day in a workshop that Jim Shore and I were doing um, in Portland. We, some folks used the five whys to look at a problem. And, and it was fascinating because they were not, they were not um, delivering a piece that, of, of, of their process that they really wanted to deliver. They were not, they just weren't doing it. And that, when we asked them, they said, well, it's just because we're not. We said, well, why aren't you? Well, we've got this reason. Well, why are you doing that? Well, we've got that reason. Well, why are you doing that? Oh, because we never, they finally got down to it. We weren't doing that. 
because we never really defined on our team what done. So it was allowing us to get sloppy on that, things higher up. So the very next iteration of the work they were doing, they went back and the first thing they did was hold a little planning session and define done for themselves because they could identify that through five whys. And what was interesting about that is that we actually did go on a couple of branches. There was, at one point, there was a question that could be answered in two ways, and so we followed those down and it came right back to no definition of done in both instances. It's fascinating. Diagram of effects is a way of looking at how one thing might, might impact another when you've got a lot of different things going on. And there's a, a similar kind of uh, tool that comes out of business process reengineering that I've never actually been able to track down the actual name of it. It's a diagram of something, but um, Esther Derby and I use it sometimes in our retrospective workshop, but we call it goes into goes out of because <laughs> that's, that's what we do with it. We, we identify things that are going on in the system and we say, which one impacts the other more, and we draw a system of arrows until um, we have a big circle, and we know what's affecting each other thing in the most in the greatest way, and then we look for the thing that has the most arrows going out of it and the most arrows going into it, and that gives us some sense of where we need to look further for root cause. Another thing that's a lot of fun um, is flow charting. We were just talking in. Um, in the, the very last um, experience report next door that Jeff gave, and he was talking about the Kaizen events that he has at his organization, and how part of that is mapping out the process flow. And, and that can be very useful. And he, as he was describing it, and as, as similar to in a way that I used to use it many years ago, have people map out the flow they think they have, and then go and actually observe people working and map out the flow they actually have and compare those two and look for the bottlenecks and pinch points and, and backward loops that, where things travel through the same hands more than one time and all the handoffs and then design the flow that you want to have and look for ways to begin to put that into action. So both of these, the plan, do, check, act, and then the tools that you might use in, in a Kaizen session or, or a root cause analysis session, all are ways of reflecting that have been around for 20, 30 years, maybe more, some of them. But the roots of our reflection, tuning, and adapting are in these, are in these things. There's another technique out there, but long before I started really using retrospectives um, and calling them that, I used to do a thing with groups that I called debriefing. Debriefing and, and then action steps, right? Very similar. Very similar to po post-mortem often stops before the action steps, but, um, but this has been around. And one of the best tools that I found for helping a group move through that. Because the really tricky part, you know, in Agile is not taking a group of really smart people and having them make decisions. Because, uh, you know, all of the individuals in a group of really smart people are fully capable of learning. They, they, they learn what they needed to know to get where they are. They know how to think things through and analyze. They know how to make decisions. But they very often have not done it as a group. They've not experienced what it's like to learn something as a team or as a group or think about something as a team, as a group, so that it becomes the team's learning, not just the individual's learning, that it really comes into the DNA of the team as an entity. And certainly, many folks have trouble deciding knowing what's the best approach for this decision, who, who should really make this decision, how should we make this decision. And what happens a lot is teams go automatically to, uh, well, since we're a team, everything must be a consensus, right? And so they start wasting enormous amounts of time trying to 
come to consensus over are we going to buy the chairs from Herman Miller or chairs sit for less? You know, are we going to go for lunch at Applebee's or Red Robin? Those are decisions you don't actually need consensus on because probably whatever chairs you buy and whatever restaurant you pick, everyone's either going to sit on them or eat there, right? Without much, without much uh, problem with that. Unless you have someone you need to really take care of because they need a special chair or they have a special diet. But people can make, you know, you can, teams can, can delegate those decisions, some of their decisions to the, to the people in the group they think are best capable of making them. Once in a while there are decisions that a whole group needs to make for itself. And, but as, as a way of ha helping groups think together, it's useful to go back to what we know about how individuals think. Because groups, it's, it's very interesting, groups, teams, or departments, organizations, if you begin to really study them, you discover they're kind of fractal. And so things that humans do, you see happening in teams. The whole teams will do. Humans go through stages of development. Musculature develops at different times. They're able, to, capable of taking on different things. Um, you know, some people talk about the terrible twos or you know, the rebellious adolescents or whatever. How many of you are familiar with for the forming, storming, norming model? Right? Teams go through that. They, they do the sort of starting out in life kind of phase and the rebellious fighting among ourselves phase. And they get to the, we've got to get down to work phase and so on. So thinking, how do we help teams think together? Well, it's useful to look at how humans think. How do humans think about something? How do they respond in a situation? So we take in some data through our senses. Right? We have some kind of response to that data. We, we you know, we, we uh, reflect on it, we have an a subjective, we take in an objective data, we have subjective response to that. We then make some meaning out of the whole thing. We probably have more subjective response to the meaning that we make. And then we actually, based on all of that, take a step. Here I am. You know, walking forward, take in the data that says the next place on this on this floor looks about the same as this one. I feel pretty secure about that. I could move forward. Okay. Put my foot out here. Oh, there seems to be my data tells me there's nothing under there. That seems a little scary. I think I will choose to pull my foot back and not step forward. That's just how we, how we do things. So we can help teams in the same way by taking them through a process, or any group of people through a process, very quick, of, by asking them some questions. Questions about the sensory data around them that they can observe. In the thing that we are thinking about right now, what have you seen? What have you heard? If it's appropriate, what did you taste or smell? So we ask that kind of objective data. And then we ask for some subjective data. What was your subjective response to this? Positive, neutral, or negative? So what pleased you in this situation? What surprised you? What challenged you? What repulsed you? Where did your energy go up? Where did your energy go down? We look for that information. And once we know that, then we can ask a group of folks questions, interpretive questions, questions about um, for analyzing, for finding root causes, implications, insights. How was this like some other situations you've been in? What worked well? What would you like to change if you could change something? What insights do you have? So, if 
reflection and interpretation. And then finally, we move on to that question about how are we going to act. Decision questions. Questions that stimulate action. What new action would you like to try? What's one thing you'll do? What's your next step? And so you, you can lead a team through these kinds of questions, and it helps them to reflect on the situation they've just been in and make some decisions about how to move forward. This process is, is well uh, documented in a book called The Art of Focused Conversation by Brian Stanfield and some et al. And it's a very, very useful book because not only does he describe this process of ORID, which we call it, or as some folks call it, what, gut, so what, now what? Another way of thinking about this. Um, but they describe this and they give many, 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 many different kinds of group meetings, group situations where you might ask these questions and give sample questions to ask. So it's, you can go there and, and sort of pull out questions, you know, are, is my team doing something that feels more like planning or is my team do feeling, doing something that more feels more like we're dealing with a conflict that just came up or, you know, what are we dealing with now? How can we stop and ask ourselves the questions that will help us to think and learn and decide together? So, so far I've talked about the plan, do, check, act, act cycle and the, um, and the root cause analysis and ORID, and all of these are ways, but what about who does this and when do they do it? So, for many, many years, uh, the military has had a structured review or debriefing process uh, initially developed by the U.S. Army and now used widely in the military um, and also by firefighters and other defense and emergency preparedness organizations for reviewing what they plan to do in their situation, describing what actually happened, analyzing why it happened, discovering how it could be done better, and then making recommendations for how to move forward, how they would like to move forward. Further, the after action reviews, it is mandated, are done by the people who were involved and those who were responsible for the event. So all the stakeholders, right? It's intended for the evaluation of an incident or project in order to improve performance by sustaining strengths and correcting weaknesses, performed as immediately after the event as possible. The, one of my sources is the Wildland Fire Lessons Learned System Center. Wild, Wildland, I can hard to say, Fire Lessons Learned Center. And they have actually a form that's called the, um, AAR roll-up, and what is it? it looks like this. After action review AAR roll-up lessons learned center. And they, you fill in the incident and the, the, the unit or who was involved and who's submitting the report and the dates of the assignment, and you have to answer all those questions. What was the most notable success? What was the most difficult challenges? So you have to have had this conversation about reviewing and describing and analyzing and discovering before, you're, before you could fill out this form, because it calls for the answers to that, to that thinking together. And then there is a place where the recommendations go. What would you recommend if future teams got themselves in this kind of situation? Kind of interesting. They've been doing that for years, and the firefighters, the U.S. Firefighting Academy uh, in Washington, D.C. has an enormous database that you can go to that tells you all the, if you want to read about any fire anywhere that you've ever heard of happen in your hometown or something, some big disaster that happened somewhere else in the U.S., you can go there and read the after action review on it, because it's 
this public public domain. So are you resting your hand? I'm just resting. Okay. <laughs> well, I noticed the thing, so but I wanted to check. Okay. So which brings us to retrospectives. I mean, a lot of the information that I've just talked about is the is the um, un understanding underlying why Esther and I wrote the book in the way we wrote the book. So we say when you're doing a retrospective, you begin by setting the stage. Help people kind of get their minds and bodies in the room, ready to do the work, ready to begin to think about what they're going to be talking about. During setting the stage, we, we choose a goal or a focus for this particular retrospective. We gather data. What do we know about this iteration or this release that just ended? What do we know about it? What did we see and hear? What events happened? Then we generate insights. So, given that those kinds of things happened, what are we going to do about that? What do, what do we think we would like to do about that? What does it tell us about our ongoing work? Where have we seen this before? What did we do well? What did we want to do differently? And then the team together decides what action they would like to take. I have a lot of recommendations about limiting that to a very small number, for, particularly for iteration retrospectives, because you want to make it doable for the team actually achieve success on this. And then you close the retrospective. And that's a time to recap what you discussed, what you learned, what you thought about, what you plan to do. And also to take a few moments to continuously improve the retrospectives. Do a little feedback on that. So. So I've just talked about a whole bunch of different ways of, retro, of, of reflecting, which can move into tuning and adapting. Are they the only? Are these the only ones? No. You can at any time in a team you can offer appreciations, which is a way of giving feedback, right? Letting somebody know, a way of reflecting on a behavior incident that has happened. Giving and, and seeking interpersonal feedback as well. Reflecting on what has just occurred and giving and having some conversation about that. Um, debrief pairing sessions. I know lots of pair teams or, and teams that have a, say that they, have to, they say at the end of every pairing session we have to stop and just answer a couple of questions. What happened? This is a good place to use ORID. What just happened while we were, what did we see and hear while we were pairing? What were our highlights or challenges? What are we still puzzled about? Are there, do we find any opportunities for improvement here? What do we want to try next time we pair together? It can be very fast, but it's very effective at increasing the learning, tuning and adapting. The stand-up meeting, asking the four questions, data gathering. What did we do yesterday? What do we plan to do today? Looking forward a little bit. What's in our way? And I love the fourth question that Mitch Lacey has added. And on a scale of one to ten, what's your confidence that we're going to meet our iteration goals? It's a lot of information there, both hard objective data and subjective data that the team then can do something about, can decide, oh, well, we want to now have an extra meeting to look at how we want to clear this impediment. Alistair wrote about mid-iteration reflection workshops during the first couple of iterations that a team is working together. Not waiting until the end of the iteration, but stopping halfway and saying, how are things going so far? What's going on? Keeping them very short, just 15 minutes, but just a check. How, how are we doing? The Dr. Phil question, how's this working for us? And the end of project retrospectives. Norm Kurth has written about holding 
larger retrospectives at the end of a project where everyone, marketing, management, everybody is present because all of those people have a role to play in getting the software out the door and looking at how we are doing our projects and how we might want to do them differently. Looking for continuous improvement at the organizational level in terms of how we organize support and run projects. And Jeff reminded me in, our, in the last session about things like Kaizen events, where at one time we called quality circles, too, where we get a group of people together and they huddle around a particular issue or problem and really dig into it until they come out with some recommendations for how things be, are done differently. So those are a lot of the how the team can tune, reflect, tune, and adapt ideas that I can think of. But this is a workshop. And so I want to move from the things that I've been able to think of to the creation of some new things that we might do. So what I'd like you to do is create yourselves into some small teams, maybe five or six people at around a table, four to six, average of five, and design an activity for a team to learn together, think together, or decide together. What I learned in instructional design was test first. Interesting. People who are professional writers of training always write their training objectives first. What is it that someone, that this group or this person will be able to do after this experience that they weren't able to do before it? You always have to do that when you're writing training. So, so design an activity and write your test first. What will, what will people be able to do after this activity? And then write up your instructions on a flip chart. Include the title of your activity, the purpose or objective, time or group size, if either of those is a constraint. Um, and step by step, how would people walk through this? And then we'll report them out. You have all, everyone in this room as a resource. So you can you talk to anyone in here that you'd like. We have, you can refer to the book. Unfortunately, that's the only one I have. That we, people in my last workshop bought all my spare copies and I haven't had time to order more. So you'll have to share. You have to share the book if you want to use it. We've got post-it notes and Sharpies and sticky notes of various sizes kinds and all kinds of supplies up here for you to work as a team learning about reflecting, tuning, and adapting, thinking together about it, and deciding on a way that you can help your team do the same thing. It's a little recursive, but I think it'll be fun. And I'm more than happy to serve as a consultant to any team that says you want me. Yeah, okay. Okay. An example of one, two, and three. Um, so you might say, um, I'm not so interested in retrospectives, and I'm not so interested in stand-up meetings, but I think it would be really helpful for my team if um, after, we, after every story was completed, we took time for some reflection. This may not be something you would choose, but it, so that would be your opportunity, right? And then you'd say, well, so what would we need to do to learn about, how could we learn about, how could we think about, how could we make decisions about story completion at that point? What would, what would what, how would I want to be, you know, what, what learning would I want to come out of that or what action would I want to come out of that in terms of teams learning and thinking together? And how would I write that as objective? My, you know, at the end of every story, the team will do this and so instead of what they're doing now. Okay. Um, so if I if I stuck with that one, um, so after every story gets moved into the done column, we're going to have a little huddle, 
And we're going to, the, only the people who have worked in a pair that worked on that story are going to come together. It's not going to be the whole team, but it's going to be a subset of the team. We're going to come together and we're going to talk about how, how correct our estimate was for that story. Were we, did we feel like we were on target or were we way off and what affected that? And we're going to um, ask ourselves what we saw in this story that caused us to estimate it the way we did and what we saw in the story that we think um, helped us write the code for it and what we thought got in our way in writing the code on it, what made it hard or easy. Right. And, um, and then we're going to uh, write up a little report. I don't know that you'd want to do this, but write up a little report uh, about about how we're how we're handling the throughput on stories, and we're going to deliver that. We're going to have some time ask, to have some time set aside for that when we do have our retrospective for us to report on how we're handling stories. If you thought something like that would have value for your team, where is the test first? Oh, well, the test first would have been um, we're going to get together and. By, as, as a result of the activity, people are going to know more about stories. And we'll be able to tell that they know about, more about stories because they'll be able to, to talk about a particular story in depth. Okay? All right? So we'll take, we've got about 45 minutes for this, and we, so we want to hear what everybody has to say. So we'll take about half an hour for this. And at the end of a half hour, or actually after about maybe 25 minutes, you'll hear that sound. And that means take a couple more minutes and wrap up because we're getting ready to present the, the things that you create, the activities that you create. And um, then we, we're going to move this flip chart easel up here. You'll be able to bring you, there are pieces of paper on most of the tables, though not all of them. That's where you write up your activity. And you bring it up here and stick it on an easel and report it, report it out. And then we'll all be done by five. Okay? So how can we reflect, tune, and adapt? How can we find new opportunities for that? 